My name is Gary Gaston. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Nashville Civic Design Center, and I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, our mission is to elevate the quality of Nashville's built environment and to promote public participation in the creation of a more beautiful and functional city for all. And you're probably wondering, I am not Ron Lustig, but as is on your program. Uh, Ron is our board president, and he had to be out of town for business today, so I agreed to graciously step in for him. And uh, I would say that it's been a wonder to, wonderful opportunity to serve with Ron this year as uh, his time as president. This is our 14th annual luncheon event. And looking out over this room, it makes me incredibly proud and happy to see what an impressive crowd we have here today. I want to start by thanking our sponsors for this event. This year, we have a record-breaking 87 sponsors in the room, which are made up of companies, organizations, and institutions in Nashville that support improving the built environment in our great city. So thank you all. Um, our presenting sponsors for this year are Mars Pet Care and LP Building Products. Thanks to you both for the support you have shown to our organization. <clears throat> our program sponsors this year are Earl Swenson Associates, the James Stephen Turner Family Foundation, and the University of Tennessee College of Architecture and Design. Please help me give a thanks to them as well. And our Keystone sponsors are the Scott C. Chambers Fund, Vanderbilt University, Village Real Estate Services, Gresh Smith and Partners, Mike and Development, and Monroe Investment Partners. Please help me thank them. And all of our Cornerstone and Boussoir sponsors are displayed on the screens on the rotating slides and are listed in our programs today, which you have at your seat. So uh, once again, could we show appreciation for all of the sponsors that we have for this event? Thank you very much. The Nashville Civic Design Center is fortunate to have an incredibly committed board of directors who have also generously committed their time to supporting our luncheon today. At this time, I would like to ask all of the current and past board of directors, members of the Civic Design Center to please stand for recognition. If you've ever been a board member, Santa, thank It's a great collection of people. Thank you. We owe, so, we owe so much to all of those who have supported the work of the Nashville Civic Design Center throughout our years. It is your support that enables us to produce the in-depth programs, initiatives, and community engagement work that we do and has come to be expected from us in this city. I also want to recognize our truly spectacular staff members, without which none of our work would be possible. We've been so fortunate over the years, in the past three years specifically, to be able to grow as an organization. And that growth in staff has allowed us to accomplish more. So um, I'd like to recognize Ron Yearwood, Melody Gibson, Fuller Hannon, Eric Hoke, Joe Mays, Jules Shaneberg and Joanne Yaki, who are our full-time staff members, as well as our support staff and our interns and our design fellows, Katie Morgan, Kelsey Osman, Michael Thompson, Daniel Toner, Lakeisha Komen, Jacqueline Cox, and Edgar Bolivar. Could you all please stand and we could recognize you, please? They, some may still be out and on. Okay, thank you so much. It takes a powerful and talented team to make all of this happen. So thank you all so much for what you do. And now I want you to have a few minutes to enjoy your lunch and we'll get started with the program shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey everyone, we're gonna get the program started. If we get your attention, please. Thanks. Um, welcome to the Nashville Civic Design Center's 14th annual luncheon event. What an amazing turnout. Look around, there's more than 750 people in this room today. It's the largest crowd in the event's history. My name is Jam Stewart and I lead corporate communications for Mars Pet Care, which is headquartered just down the street in Williamson County. I'm so honored to be here today representing more than 1,000 Mars employees 
who live and work in the area. You might have heard that we bring ARPS to work too, and I didn't bring mine today, but Music City Center, we're having a conversation after this to see how we can make this event pet friendly next year. I'm thrilled to be here and to serve as the co-chair for the luncheon, and thank you all so much for coming. Today we will hear more about the important work of Nashville Civic Design Center and all it has accomplished over the last 12 months. We will also hear from Mayor Barry on some of her priorities related to the built environment in the coming year, and we will gain some valuable insights from our esteemed keynote speaker, Majora Carter, about her experiences in working around the, in cities around the country to make cities more vibrant and better places to live. These messages perfectly align with the mission of the Civic Design Center to create a more beautiful, functional city for all, and it definitely coincides with today's program theme of citizenship in action. Ben? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ben Skoog. I'm the Vice President of Growth and Innovation at LP Building Products. Um, and I have the honor of serving this year with JAM as uh, co-chairs and sponsors of this event. Um, for those of you that may know LP Building Products, it should be no surprise to you that we are here. Um, and it's an expression of our belief and the value that we see in the work that the National Civic Design Center does. Um, there's a lot that the NCDC has been doing for Nashville, and we'll touch a little bit more on that later. Uh, but a little bit about LP, we are a building materials manufacturer. Uh, we've been in business for over 40 years. We're continually improving the products that we make today, and we're also keeping our eye on the changing needs of the housing market and developing new products for that. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, but for now, I'll turn it back over to Jam. Thanks. It was at this event last year that Mayor Barry announced our partnership with Metro and the Civic Design Center to create a more pet-friendly friendly city right here. Uh, through design development and transformative collaborations and we've been working really hard over the last 12 months to do just that the partnerships with the design center the mayor's office metro departments and other key private and public partners many who are in this room today have accomplished a lot so much so we could do an entire program just giving you those updates but we won't because gary has a schedule um, but if you got a chance to see the displays as you came in today, you might be able to um, take a peek at some of, those progress, some of that progress. And on your way out, if you didn't see it, uh, stop by. I'm thrilled that our work will continue over the coming year as we roll out this pet-friendly city playbook based on the work that we're doing right here in Nashville to cities and um, to cities all around the and country, to cities around the country and all around the world to follow. Nashville Civic Design Center is a critical partner in this work. With its forward-thinking global perspective, the Design Center allows Nashville to test innovative best practices from around the world, enabling the city to showcase the best a community can really be. Uh, talk a little bit about the work of the uh, Design Center. And it's affected me both professionally and personally. Um, and the focus that the Design Center has had on making downtown more livable and attractive um, actually has been one of the key proponents to driving the revitalization of Nashville. All right. Uh, go back a little bit in history. In 2003, LP was looking to relocate our corporate headquarters from Portland, Oregon, and consolidate uh, multiple offices from across the nation. Uh, we looked at a lot of cities, and we heard a lot of proposals. But I tell you, Nashville had the best story, and they had a vision for the transformation of the city. And in 2003, it wasn't 2017, it was a different city back then. Now, we ended up choosing Nashville for a corporate headquarters for a lot of reasons, but a lot of that had to do with the vision that the design center had laid out for downtown. Um, so we moved here in 2004. Uh, several of us got pretty active in helping attract people to move downtown. Um, but I gotta tell you, it was tougher. It was, like I said, it was a little different environment back then, but we kept telling people, it's gonna get better. Um, believe us, move downtown, get to know Nashville. Well, actually, the city got to action. We built a new transit center. Uh, we put in more parks and greenways. We put in more residences. We put in more amenities. We built a baseball stadium. And I think as everybody's experiencing now, people are coming in droves. So not only did they put out a great vision, they got to the execution of it. And the results, I think, we're seeing today. So again, I just want to put my praise to the design center. They're a great influencer and visionary, but they're also very active in making it a reality. So, uh, on the personal side, uh, I'm looking to move into East Nashville myself next spring, so we'll see how that goes. But I tell you, back when we first did move here, it was very uncommon for our employees to live anywhere but the suburbs. Fast forward to today, it's very common for people to live within a mile of our office, uh, which is just up the street. Um, so I think that speaks for itself. Um, and one of the things that I've seen that the Nashville Civic Design Center is 
not only are they trying to just create an economic area, they're trying to create a culture. They're trying to preserve the, the character and the vintage of the city, too. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jam, and uh, we'll take it from there. I'm a fairly recent transplant to Tennessee myself, um, and it's been so exciting for me not to just know the city, but some of the key leaders in this room, and the Civic Design Center has been such a big part of that. Through our close collaboration over the past year, I've seen the tremendous value and respect that this organization brings to this community and throughout the region. I've seen the ways in which it strives to help communities improve while also working to preserve and honor the character and qualities of places that have always been there, as Ben mentioned as well. It has been a pleasure of mine to serve with you as co-chair today, Ben. Thank you for all of your work, and a big thanks to all of you in this room. We now have the distinct honor of welcoming to the podium someone whose leadership, vision, energy, and enthusiasm is taking Nashville to the next level. She also inspires me. I deeply admire her compassion, respect, and fight for all, including those with four legs. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd help me welcome to the podium, the Honorable Mayor, Megan Berry. Well, good afternoon. How is everybody? Let's try that again. Good morning. Now I'll try it. It's actually afternoon, so you see I'm already running behind. Good afternoon. It's good to see you all. We're joined today uh, by several other elected officials that I want to give a, a quick shout out to. We have State Representative Jason Powell is with us. Uh, and. We're also born, uh, uh, we also have several council members who've joined us. We have Mary Carolyn Roberts is here, and Jeff Syracuse, Berkeley Allen, who's my council member, uh, Angie Henderson, Fabian Bednay, Sharon Hurt. I think we've got everybody. So thanks to Jam and Ben for that really kind introduction and for all of the amazing work that you all put in to make this event so special. Uh, I also have a couple of other thanks I want to give a shout out to. We have board president uh, Ron Lustig and all the other members of the Civic Design Center and they're in the board. If you're on the board, will you just raise your hand so we can say thank you? Thank you. And the person who makes it all go, the CEO, Gary Gaston, and all the rest of the staff. If you're a member of the staff, will you also raise your hand? We also have the great honor to hear today from Majora Carter, who is not only a dynamic thinker and developer, but she has great insights into how to build urban communities. And that is absolutely what we are becoming. So that'll be exciting. Uh, Mars Pet Care as well, who sponsored uh, this luncheon. They have been amazing partners with us in the Better Cities for Pets initiative, uh, and I've actually started to see more pets out and about. Uh, the farmer's market recently announced that the farmer's market was a place where you could bring your pet, so if you haven't done that yet, take a Saturday and head to the farmer's market. Uh, and Mars Pet Care was also just recognized as one of the world's best 25 places to work, so congratulations to Mars on that. Also want to thank LP Building Products. They are today's other major sponsor, sponsor, which is working with the Civic Design Center and the University of Tennessee's College of Architecture on student design concepts for affordable housing downtown, and we know how important that is. This is my third time to attend this wonderful lunch as mayor, and I have to tell you that everything in our city continues to evolve with just lightning speed and it is becoming more and more clear the importance of the Civic Design Center. So it's amazing. You know, I don't see our trend of growth stopping anytime soon. Uh, we are growing, we're gonna keep growing, and growth is also critical to our long-term success, but we have to be thoughtful about how we do it. It's funny, this morning uh, I, I host a, a breakfast with the mayor, and uh, if any of y'all want to ever come and have breakfast with me in my office, please let me know. We bring group, uh, you know, groups of folks who are interested in just talking about Nashville issues together, and this morning around the table, we did not have one person who was born in Nashville. Everybody had come here in the last 10 years, and they had come from all over, LA, 
Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Mississippi. So many people are coming to Nashville and finding their home. And when they come, design matters about how our city looks and feels and function. It helps define who we are and it just shows what our values are in our city. And the Civic Design Center has been on our side the whole time, helping us succeed in creating those values for our city. And when we succeed, I am sure that Nashville will continue to be one of the most livable cities anywhere, but we have to be intentional about it. So we're growing, we're attracting a lot of talent. I think that's because we continue to be a very warm and welcoming place. I think it also means that people want to come here for all of the design and amenities that our city offers, our high quality of life, our playgrounds, our parks, our cultural assets, and that connection that we provide between neighborhoods. We're also a place where I find that people work together. Uh, those lines that traditionally separate public and private and not-for-profits and other communities, they don't exist here. We actually all come together to solve problems, and then those problem solvings create a lot of opportunities. So I'm so grateful that the Civic Design Center has partnered with Metro Planning, they've partnered with Public Works, they've partnered with my office, and all kinds of Metro departments to use that kind of tactical urbanism that we talked about last year. Uh, many of you remember Jeanette uh, Sadiq Khan who came last year, she was New York City's former transportation commissioner. Uh, she spoke at the breakfast last spring and she has helped us implement many of those things. She's been back to our office several times uh, and helped. And we implement these quick win, low cost projects so that we can achieve those immediate improvements across a lot of neighborhoods. And, uh, and as we continue, I know we'll see more of those partnerships. Uh, we also appreciate how much the Civic Design Center has put so much in energy into providing and prioritizing health, health as part of our community. You know, Nashvilleians aren't that healthy. That's, I know, not a newsflash. But shaping the healthy community, the Nashville plan, gives us a strong framework for thinking about how we can build that healthier city, a city that works for everybody. And you knew I had to get here sooner or later. That's gonna bring me to transit. Transit, transit, transit. How many of y'all were at the transit announcement uh, about two weeks, three weeks ago? I had the pleasure of having with me at that announcement all of the great builders of our city who came before me. People like Governor Bredesen, Bill Purcell, Mayor Dean, who's the ballroom that we're sitting in, and all of the energy that they have put into the city in the past, we are reaping the benefits and the opportunity now for us to go forward as a city is all around transit. Uh, it's a major investment. It's a $5.2 billion plan, and that plan comes after many, many years of talking about it. Now, I do this in a lot of audiences that I'm in, so I'm gonna ask all of you too. How many of y'all drove here today? How many of y'all walked? How many of y'all took your bike? How many of y'all got on a bus? Go back to those car riders for me, raise your hands again. How many of you at, law, at least carpooled? Wait, some people were raising their hands that hadn't raised their hands before. <laughs> Our traffic problem is we have to have less vehicles on the road and more options for transit. And that means bikes, it means sidewalks, it means buses, and it means light rail. And in order to get all of those folks around downtown, it means a, a tunnel, which is also incredible because we have to provide enough surface area on top downtown for us to continue to have a thriving downtown. That means a place where pedestrians can come. It also means a place for pedal taverns. So, <laughs> and when we think about the future and we think about the investment in our city, when we build that transit system, it's about connection. It's about mobility, it's about opportunity, and it's about making sure that people have the best options if they wanna go from north to south to east and west in Nashville. And it's also about creating independence. Creating that independence so you don't have to have a car to get around our city. Because if we are going to become a transit-oriented, friendly city, 
it means that we're also going to be able to create transit investment along our pikes and corridors. And that's really important because we know that part of this transit conversation is about housing as well. This is not an or conversation, it's an and conversation. When we look at the, comp the compilation of what makes you cost burdened, it's a housing and transit conversation. So we need to lessen the burden on transit and create more affordable housing. And this transit plan helps us do that. It also makes us healthier. It, there's a lot of studies out there that show if you walk to your transit stop because you're five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes away, it means you're gonna get a little exercise and that's gonna help Nashvilleians be healthier. And as we think about what we have to do around the affordability, there's also always that fear of displacement. So I've asked former Mayor Bill Purcell and uh, 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 County Clerk Brenda Wynn to step up and help me with that. And they're going to co-chair a task force that is going to look at the affordability along our pikes and corridors to make sure that we don't see that displacement, that displacement for families and local businesses. And I think that's key. When we think about what we have to do as a community, the one thing I definitely know is government can't do this by ourselves. We are all in this together and we have great partners like the Civic Design Center that is helping us tackle these very complex issues. And many of you know that one of those issues when I spoke last year was around engaging our youth. We had a very bold initiative this summer where we wanted to put 10,000 10,000 of our kids to work this summer, aged 14 to 24, in paid meaningful internships. And we know why that's important. We know why, because there is so much research about generational poverty. We know that if you graduate from high school, you get your first job, and you don't have a kid till you're financially stable, the likelihood that you're poor goes way down. So we were very, very focused on that second piece, connecting kids to jobs. And it all started with a phone call that I'd had with my own kid. And I think that this is a good way to think about it. He had been a junior in college, he needed an internship, and he called me up and he said, Mom, I need an internship. And I said, fine, call, call, call Dave, my friend Dave, and he did. And Dave said, yeah, sure, you can come have an internship with me. And Max, my son, called me back and said, Mom, Dave said he's gonna hire me, but I don't wanna take it if the only reason I'm gonna get it is because I'm your kid. I said the only reason you're gonna get it is because you're my kid, because you're totally not qualified. <laughs> and that's pretty much sums up most kids in Nashville and other places. So as a mom and a mayor, I felt it was my responsibility to open the door to all the 350 businesses that stepped up for 11,700 jobs this summer. Now we had 8,700 kids who came through and got those jobs, but I had more jobs than I had kids. So the opportunity next summer is I still need those jobs, but I need you to help me find those kids. So that's my challenge to all of you. And I wanna thank the Civic Design Center because you hired three of my Opportunity Now kids. And it was great. Some of the comments that they did on their surveys coming back after this were priceless. One child in particular said, you know, I wasn't sure what it was gonna be like to work with old people. <laughs> You're the old people in this scenario. He said, but they were great. They helped me. They taught me skills, communication skills. And the next time I have to go out and get a job, I've got a skill base to start with. That changed that kid's life. And thank you for doing that. And thank you to all the rest of the organizations here that stepped up and made that happen. I also know that, you know, as we think about what's to come in Nashville, these are really exciting times. We continue to be a place where people want to move and they want to be. I have the chance to talk to lots of mayors across the world, and I, I mean the world. And when I say that I'm the mayor of Nashville, their faces light up. They are like, oh my gosh, you have the best city. And they always say, what makes it so special? And I will tell you what I respond. 
My response is Nashville is absolutely a place that says, what can I do for you, not what can you do for me? And that is who we are, and that is what the Civic Design Center does every day, and we are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Barry. We're always so thrilled to have you come and talk and just incredible words. So hello again, I'm back. Uh, if you have noticed, haven't noticed today, our theme is citizenship in action. As a central component of our mission, community engagement and public participation has always been critical components to the projects and programming that we offer at the Civic Design Center. That was, ex that was exemplified by the plan of Nashville and continues to remain a part of what we do every day. Now more than ever, meaningful engagement with citizens in the creation and ultimate implementation of projects and programming is of critical importance. Citizenship in action is at the foundation of what we do, what we have done, and what we strive to do in the future. The display boards in the lobby on your way inside the room today um, are gonna offer you much more information on the work that we've done over the past year. I could, again, like Jam said, I could stand up here for 90 minutes and tell you about everything that we do, but I only have about seven. So um, I want to just touch on a few of the things and then you can get, learn more about it um, through our website and visiting the organization. So just a few months ago, we published the Neighborhood Assessment Toolkit which is an extension of the Plan of Nashville's 10 Principles and the Neighborhood Assessment portion of our Shaping Healthy Community book. The toolkit provides guidance to developers and neighborhood associations to help foster an engaged and informed dialogue for success successful community redevelopment efforts. Last year, the Civic Design Center was the recipient of a grant from the Pew Charitable Trust and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, also based on our work on Shaping Healthy Communities. The grant awarded us funding to take the methodology we had used in creating the healthy communities approach and work with communities outside of Middle Tennessee in rural East Tennessee and uh, suburban West Tennessee. Our work related to this grant will officially end this month, but the impacts on these counties have been tremendous, and I'm very excited that the partnerships that we formed during this process will continue and will have positive impacts in those areas. Uh, we'll be publishing a final report on that work later this month. As you've heard, the Design Center has been working very closely with MARS over the past year to better understand and support the critical role uh, pets play on our lives and our health. Um, as you can see, yeah, I'm sorry, and how we can improve the physical infrastructure of our city as well as the policies that govern them related to pets. This image is from the Nashville launch of our prototype dog park, which has traveled around quite extensively already in its short existence. It went to Austin earlier this year. And we're very much uh, looking forward to continuing the partnership with Mars Pet Care. Today we also welcome the University of Tennessee College of Architecture and Design, who uh, once again has made the journey from Knoxville, Tennessee to join us today. Thank you, there's two tables here, I believe. Hello. Uh, Dean Poole, thank you for your continued support of the Design Center. It's a relationship that we deeply value in Nashville and is a truly tremendous impact for our city. Uh, Professor T.K. Davis, thank you for your ongoing work based here in Nashville and the innovative land use and transportation studies that you do with your students. And I also want to, as was mentioned earlier, the LP uh, partnership to study innovative uh, housing typologies for high-rise wood structures, which is something that we really don't know much about. So we're uh, expanding our growth and innovation and in looking at new designs on that. Also continue looking forward to working with LP. Our Reclaiming Public Space initiative is aimed at improving the built environment for use by all. This includes physical improvements to the public realm, site-specific publications, case studies, best practices, and education of the Nashville community on how to create and sustain great places. This includes the successful parking day, which this year we had over 80 parking spaces in downtown and uh, the urban core of the city. Uh, it includes our Reclaiming Public Space Tactical Urbanism Group, as the mayor mentioned earlier, in partnership with Metro Departments, uh, Public Works Planning, 
And just this past September, we received a national AARP grant called Community Challenge, which uh, was funding to help us implement some of these projects in Elizabeth Park and Green Hills. And we'll be working very closely over the next week to try to get those finished. It was a short timeline. Uh, two years ago at this event, we announced a grant from the James Stephen Turner Family Foundation to fund the creation of an educational curriculum that was to be based on content from our Plan of Nashville book and the Shaping Healthy Communities. The curriculum, which is called uh, Citizenship in Action, has two major components. One is a Community Design 101 course, which is taught in classrooms for educational purposes for students grades 7 to 12. And as well as our Design Your Neighborhood program, which is our summer uh, internship for high school students. Just this past summer, we completed the piloting phase for this curriculum, and we had 365 students participate during the piloting phase. And in this current academic year, we anticipate nearly 1,500 students who will be participating in our Citizenship in Action curriculum. So it's just an incredible amount of work that's been accomplished in two short years in this process. Um, the youth that have participated have showed impressive growth in their awareness of what's built around them, uh, developing mapping skills, neighborhood design skills, and most importantly, empowerment to become a force of positive changes in their own communities. And today we have with us uh, student guests who participated in this program at several different schools across Nashville, as well as joined by Melody Gibson, who's directed this project. And I would just like to recognize the students and all the staff members who've been involved in this. Could you please stand? Thank you so much. And finally, if you've never had the chance to visit our office, I want to extend the invitation for you to visit for an exciting event that's coming at the, uh, just at the end of this month. It's an exhibition called Letters to the Mayor, Nashville. It was organized by Storefront for Archi Art and Architecture and was originally initiated in New York in 2014. It has now been replicated in 15 countries, cities around the world, with Nashville being the first city outside of New York to have this exhibition in the country. Local and international architects will be writing letters to our mayor, Megan Berry. The letters will be delivered to the mayor at the opening ceremony, and they will be on display for over, just over two months. So you'll have a chance to come and see that and see the powerful um, recognition and potential that design can to participate in the voice of the architecture community as a letter to the mayor. And I want to recognize uh, the pivotal person who's made this uh, possible, this exhibition, uh, Ms. Fuller Hannon on our staff. Thank you, Fuller, for all you've done on that. So uh, it's just a quick snapshot. I could, again, continue, but uh, we're not here for this. We're here for someone else. So uh, please come visit us, uh, participate in our programs throughout the year, visit the exhibition, visit our website, read more on how we really want you to get involved as citizens in action. And so you'll hear more about that in our closing remarks. But now I get the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker today, who is Ms. Majora Carter. And I, uh, Majora is sort of m numerous uh, things that she's done. She is an urban revitalization strategist, consultant, and real estate developer, winner of a Peabody a Broadcasting Award, and recipient of the prestigious John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation's fellowship program, which is more commonly known as a genius grant. And if you have a chance to spend some time with her, you will recognize she received that. Uh, I first discovered Ms. Carter with uh, a fellow staff member, Stephanie McCullough, who's here, when we were working together at Civic Design Center, and we saw her TED Talk, and this was about 10 years ago. And I have to tell you, it is so incredibly inspiring. And so you might not have even, you didn't know us, but for 10 now, years now, you have been inspiring the Civic Design Center. And anytime I feel like I need inspiration, I, I've gone back and watched that video, which has now been watched over 1.7 million times on uh, TED, and it's one of the first original six TED Talks. So it, it is so incredibly wonderful to have you finally join us in Nashville for the first time, and we hope to have you back many times in the future. Please help me, help me welcome Majora Carter. I just, 
That's so sweet. Thank you guys, really, seriously. It, um, it means a lot to me um, to hear stuff like that. And we're friends now, so that's all I'm saying. But anyway, thank you so much. And all I, I got to tell you, I get it. I totally get it. Nashville's hot. Right? I swear, it's like, you know, I, I work all over the country, so, you know, I have to, like, keep up on some, some things, but what has been really clear is over the past five, ten years, it's like Nashville, it's like one of the top ten places to live, top ten places to move to, blah, 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 Nashville, 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 and I'm like, okay, I get it. I totally do. Your mayor really like, articulated it really beautifully between the, the kind of work that's going on, you know, you've got 150 people moving here each day. You've got um, this transit thing, which is such a smart, smart thing to do. It's really awesome, and I really hope y'all voted in with, well. Um, but with all of those great things that are happening, there's also, you know, people are people. And there's fear around change. And with great change also comes you got to have some great responsibility to deal with it and to help make it really just go forward. Um, and so, but what is also clear is that with, as we continue to think about how are we going to grow and develop, that is all that I've been doing for many, many years at this point. Um, oh, this is not... Oh, dear. Okay, so hopefully it'll work for the rest of it, but I think we're going to... It says community is corporation and talent retention strategies. So I think that's, hopefully that's clear. But the, con the approach that we've been taking, you know, as we think about how communities develop, um, and especially, you know, in the, the, the kind of instance that change in, in and of itself means that, you know, when you build that transit thing, or people, some people who are living in the, the great communities are gonna feel like, do I really want those other people coming here? And of course, the specter of gentrification, where people feel like they've gotta hold on to the little bit that they have for fear of being displaced. Like, those things are real and need to be addressed. But the other thing, you know, again, the, the approach that we take is we really like to think about if we think as communities themselves as corporations, if you think about a company, you've got yourself a company, your goal, if you invest talent in your staff, you do it to retain it, to make sure that you know, they're there to help advance the mission and, and goals of your organization to increase your bottom line. You wanna see them thrive. If they're happy, they're probably gonna make the company happy, make the company more money. That's how, you know, Google has famous examples of like ping pong tables and free snacks and stuff like that to make it happen. But of course, we all do it in our own way. But retaining the talent is the most important thing we can do. And in American low status communities, in general, we're not doing that. And so our approach to the way that we've actually done real estate development is, is all about how do we not just attract the talent, that we need so our communities can thrive, but retain the talent that's there as well. And so some of those things, so when we started thinking about how can we make this happen, oh, there we go, hmm, okay. Well, anyway, so what we started thinking about and we moving into real estate development, we were all about how do we develop, you know, way, really understand what are the needs and the aspirations of people within our own community and what is it that they want? Because here we were, a very poor community of color up in, up in the South Bronx in New York City, and the goal there was, was trying to understand, like, are they, what do they want? What are the needs? What are the aspirations and what are the goals? And so some of the questions that we ask, and I can tell you what some of them Hello? Okay. Are, what are some of the, you know, are you, do you think that have, do you believe that having people of different and higher educational backgrounds in Hunts Point will actually serve our community? You know, do you believe that the number of people working at different income levels above poverty in Hunts Point, would that benefit the Hunts Point community overall? And will, do you think that being, living in a poor community like Hunts Point generally makes it so that you get worse service and worse goods be than, than um, other higher income communities. And last of all, but, but of least, do you believe the availability of quality mixed income housing will help keep more successful people in your communities? And overwhelmingly, the responses were, yeah. Like we know being in a poor community actually degrades our quality of life. And not because there's anything inherently wrong with poor people, it's just that the reality is that we know that that's what happens. 
And so we were really clear that folks were not interested in seeing more of that. And the other thing is, so when we were asked them, well, what are you looking for in your own community? What are, are you know, are, it was clear that they didn't want the kind of things that were the markers of what you find in poor communities, from health clinics and quote unquote community centers, um, dog poop and litter on the street. Like these were the actual things people said they didn't want. Um, homeless shelters. They, in fact, wanted the same things that anybody in this room would want. They wanted great places to hang out. They wanted coffee shops and restaurants and bars. They wanted really great parks. They wanted you know, housing that actually matched their income because there absolutely were people who were not all chronically poor. And they didn't have things like that mostly in the community. And they wanted the aspirational models of people like them, people that they knew were like, hustling to like, you know, get the next kind of great thing going on in their life. They were ambitious in terms of their career goals. They wanted to see beautiful things happen in their own community. And it was really different than what, you know, many people like to think about when the, when you talk about what you want to see in a poor community. They weren't simply just saying they wanted to see um, more affordable housing the way that the social justice industrial complex would tell you. So I'm not having any, uh, movement on the next slide. So one of the things that we had to think about was like, well, what if we know all this, then how do, in you knowing that poverty is not a cultural attribute and we're working in low status communities, how do we continue to make sure that we're doing the kind of development that we wanna see happening? And so we looked at the work that we were doing and realized like, well, who are we actually do, you know, to do this work? Um, that we wanted to make sure that what we do is actually align the self-interest of many different groups, you know, from, the, from folks who are, okay, click on it. So as a business owner and a social entrepreneur, part of my job you know, is to look at what are the market needs and then help create businesses that respond to that. We, another partner that we often worked with was government and how do we deal with folks with, with government who really their job is to create more opportunities within um, their cities and to do it as easily and as efficiently as they can. So I understood the kind of pressures that they were under. Um, next is like, pe frankly, people in rooms like this, we are the educated elite. You know, we're the design professionals, we're the government professionals, we're the ones who are, who are actually tasked to sort of make our cities better, you know, obviously in consult with the people that we're essentially serving in those communities. But ultimately, you know, and last but definitely not least, yellow. You know, I'm from a low status community. I'm, I'm a girl from the hood. So having all of that kind of makes us really well positioned to kind of be a bit of a glue to help make folks both within those communities and also the folks that we are actually working for and also our own projects actually kind of sing in ways that they haven't before. So it's really inspiring to kind of have, you know, an understanding of, the, of, of how people are trying to like get their self-interest taken care of and to know that there are actually ways to do that in terms of how we develop our communities. So some of you might know that this the work that I'm about to tell you about, and the, all of this work is all about how not just we're aligning the self-interest of different groups so that they can see the value in the work that we're doing, but also thinking about you know, how we create the kind of talent, or rather support the talent in our community so that it stays. And so back in my early days, we did, we were, our city was being, our community was being targeted by the city and the state to sort of trans, to continue to use it as a repository for the waste that mostly um, wealthier and wider New York City communities could deal, didn't have to deal with. And so part of the work that we did was really thinking about, well, how can we think of, you know, sort of transforming the idea of our community as a dump into a place that people in our own communities wanted to fight for. And again, not in a way that they were fighting against stuff, but really wanted to fight for. Like, what do we want there? And we really looked at how the land was often used against us, and then we decided we're gonna use it for us. And that's when we discovered this little plot of land that the city, that, um, excuse me, that the U.S. Forest Service actually was, was offering little $10,000 seed grants in order to create, you know, parks along the Bronx River because it was one of those threatened urban waterways. And so, um, so next slide, please. So the idea there was that we would take that spot and transform it into something that you know, it was a beta version of first because we needed to make sure that people understood that there was even a waterfront and they could actually go to it. And so we went through a bunch of many different uh, iterations. Next slide. 
um, and made it to the, develop it into this spot. So that little $10,000 seed grant, after many iterations, my, my dog pulling me down to what I thought was a dump, and then we discovered that it was actually dead-ended at the Bronx River, and because we were able to leverage that little bit of money and the ideas around both government, business community, and also people, of course, in the local community, we were able to then sort of leverage that into a $3 million park that we see right here. And this is what it looked like back in 2006, right after the park was, was actually built. Um, and by creating this new opportunity, next slide, um, it really became the kind of thing that the community itself like, just adored because we did not have those kind of what you, what you would call amenities, but I would call them actually just re real parts of a, of, a, of a thriving community and transform them into opportunities that, um, you know, if I could just like wave my hand because this is not working. Um, so next slide. Um, turn this into the kind of place that we want it to be in. And this is the, the dog that actually helped me discover the park and pulled me into that dump. She died um, around the time of Hurricane Sandy, but now I have two additional dogs. That's for my new friends at the, at the spot, uh, Mars Pets Care. But it really became this kind of awesome spot that people wanted to see, but really it made, it was a direct response to make sure that people in our community knew we had something to fight for. Next slide. And next slide. Oh, and this is the award that we won for um, excellence in um, urban design, and that's Zena with her well-deserved award. Next slide. And so the South Bronx Greenway, or rather the um, East Coast Greenway, goes all the way from Maine to Miami. And so we understood that those that greenways themselves actually could create real opportunities for local economic development, connect, you know, connectivity between different communities, and really show that we were a part of, 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 of something that was great. But what also what we know that many communities that um, that greenways often do, at least within our communities, we knew that we were isolated. We were not even included as part of it, even though New York City was about to get one. Next slide. Um, so I actually wrote the original proposal for a, um, you know, for the South Bronx Greenway, and we were able to get about a um, total of 150 a million dollars specifically to create the the first phase um, the first phase of the greenway which was on water as well as like through the actual um, as well as through the actual neighborhood and it was all designed you know as ways to really make the connections keep going and so this was just the, one of the first phase projects, and they were just little medians that literally kept you know um, errant truck drivers from going up these residential streets. But next slide. They were able. We once we planted them, then they became tools for stormwater management as well, and be, you know having and a really sense of a beautiful place too. Next slide. And next slide. And creating the and again having this kind. No one. This was not the kind of thing that next slide people thought we could have in this community as well. Um, and then go to the next slide. Okay. And this is one of my favorite parts of it, because again, greenways are about connectivity. But again, where this greenway from the South Bronx, one of the poorest congressional districts, you know, was going to connect us to Randall's Island, which is a 400-acre park that actually was more often used by, um, by kids from private schools in Manhattan. And so even though we were only separated from like just 25 feet of water, um, it, was, it actually was, there was tension in New York City about building this greenway that would give us access into this waterfront. And so what it actually allowed us to do, next slide, um, what, we, what the development of this greenway and actually getting the feasibility um, plan and the design study out there was also able to, next slide up, we were able to plan to make that happen. So one of my first interns when I started Sustainable South Bronx, which is a nonprofit that we did this work under, was really about how do we make this happen. So my very first intern who started out as a Jesuit Volunteer Corps member um, came to me. We worked together for two years. The, one of her main projects was the South Bronx Greenway. She then you know, helped get her into MIT, the Urban Planning School, and then she went on to the New York City Economic Development Corporation, who was actually managing the, the proposal of the, uh, the, the project of getting this thing built. It took four years, but basically being able to sort of see this young woman's mind, Kate Van Tassel, um, you know, with the idea of like how we can use real estate development in particular, this stuff to make these things happen was an incredible place. And this is me literally at the, uh, the beginning of the Greenway going to Randall's Islands. It was a real proud moment for this to happen. But again, you know, coming from just the idea of making sure that we were a part of the physical landscape of a, of a national Greenway model Next slide. 
And so what's really cool now is remember it, at the beginning we weren't even a part of it. Next slide. We are actually a dedicated part of the, of the actual um, East Coast Greenway system. And there goes South Bronx Greenway on there. So next slide. And so these are the next few slides, and just um, run through for a little bit. These are the next few slides are the type of business developments that people don't necessarily, when you think of poor communities, um, these are the kind of things you see, from 99 cent stores to liquor stores, pharmacies, you know, they're the kind of things that make people feel like, oh, you are definitely in a poor community. Um, you, know, you don't have great options for healthy food, you have places where you've got opportunities for, you know, you're not gonna um, develop your financial well-being by you know, having payday loan places and stuff like that around. Um, and also, last but definitely not least, we also have our um, super highly subsidized, quote unquote, affordable housing. And so before folks start saying that, oh, Majora Carter must not, must say poor communities and everything that's in them, not true whatsoever. But what we do know is that we, and when we concentrate, you know, all of these type of things in one community, if we concentrate, what you'll end up getting, you'll concentrate poverty along with it. You literally create the, the opportunities for there to be increased amounts of, of poor health outcomes, lower educational attainment, higher rates of crime, um, you know, even, and I think especially, a feeling of less hope that's there, that's, that's theirs for people in the making. And essentially, what you'll also find is that you don't think of ways that people are uh, trying to, you know, we're telling people in young communities like this that they should measure success by how far they get away from places like this. That is what those communities tell them without a shadow of a doubt. And because we don't believe that gentrification happens you know, when white people start moving into formerly communities of color, gentrification happens when we start telling kids from communities like this that there is no value there. And that if they want to grow up and be somebody, they've got to grow up and get out of those places. And essentially, that is what happened. We're telling the talented ones to leave. We're exacerbating brain drain by creating and, and actually expecting those communities to stay as they are. Um, and, uh, but I gotta tell you, just because, because I feel that there's only two different kinds of real estate development in low status communities. There's one that's a very typical one that scares people, um, which is gentrification, which means you know poor people, you know developers come in and then you know they they build new stuff and it makes it you know unaffordable for poor folks that are there and people are displaced. And then the other kind is poverty level economic maintenance, wherein you've got people who um, are you know who where those all those type of, of things that I showed you before, they're the ones that uh, you know from the from uh, public health from excuse me. Uh, subsidized uh, affordable housing to uh, all those crappy stores and stuff like that. Those are the type of things that read and bleed, as far as I'm concerned, poverty level economic maintenance. Because somebody's making a lot of money off of it, but none of the people in the communities are really happy to be there. Or they're trying to look their next way out. Um, so if that's not how you retain the talent in a community. So, but if you're really thinking about but the bottom line is, just because we've been telling folks in communities like that they shouldn't value them, doesn't mean that folks from the outside are not have seeing value in it. And so these are just some of the, the types of notices that I get under my door. Um, next one. Um, oh, you can't see the top. Um, or the kind of notes where basically folks are trying to convince folks, next slide, or trying to convince people to sell their houses early and cheap. And they do because they often don't see the value in their own community. They're not thinking long terms about how can we stay and reinvest in our community. And if someone comes and offers them a, a bit of cash really quickly, then it becomes clear that you know what? There's no value really here. So I don't need to stay here. I don't need to, like, I'm, this, this guy wants to buy it? Fine, they can have it. But ultimately, what that means is that if we devalue the, the, the quality of our own land, then and others see value in it, that's when, that's when it starts to happen. But what about the people who are actually trying to say they want to see good things happen? And so when we realized that what we needed was to see more mixed income housing, mixed use commercial development, and really create opportunities for people who actually did own property in our communities to, to maintain their ownership stake and actually be the ones who are developing it, 
or creating businesses that I will actually cater to the, to the changing community. Um, you know, we've got a lot of intel from people in our own community. And some of these folks are folks that actually came to us because they wanted to have more input in the kind of work that we were already doing. And we, they're ingloriously named the Hunts Point Advisory Board. And they were the ones who we literally would, would sort of pitch our projects to and we'd get feedback from them as a way to make it happen. And because they were interested in seeing their community thrive the way a, a corporation would. Um, they wanted to see talent re be retained in their community. Um, and they were not fighting against stuff. They wanted to see how it could work for them. And, um, and they were also became, it wasn't like this finger wagging in your face kind of thing. They really, they were willing to work, you know, with our elected officials and regulators to make sure things happen. As a matter of fact, when there was actually a really significant transportation project, the, our city department of transportation commissioner wouldn't even hold a press conference about it until those people that wore these red shirts showed up because they knew that they were actually very much a part of helping to, to make these things happen, which was really kind of amazing. Um, but these were the, th hold on, go back to please, another one. Yeah, so these were the kind of things that people decided that they wanted to see in, in, in the community that they didn't have. There wasn't you know, great opportunities for high quality and, and beautiful and built environments. Um, those kind of things that were often missing from low status communities. They wanted to see new opportunities for job creation. You know, they knew that we were, experience, we were experiencing brain drain in our own communities, like the smart, hardworking kids I told you about. You know, even many of the ones that were older, after a while, got tired of the fact that, you know, instead of having a great place to go and hang out in, um, what we got were more community centers. And I don't know of many people who, when they get to a point they grew up in, in a low status community, I don't know of many that actually want to move out and move up in the world and move up to another place that has more community centers. They want the places with the bars, with the, with the great parks, with the, with the restaurants. Those are the type of things that our communities want. And so what we, and because that community center thing is, is, the, is the, I don't think poverty is that romantic for people that actually are poor. But it's the kind of thing that I think a lot of folks believe, you know, from looking on the outside looking in, are just like, well, that's what you do in poor communities. You wouldn't think that if you were really thinking about how do we like make communities thrive and actually become taxpayers as opposed to tax burdens. And that's the, the real truth about you know, so much of the work that we're doing. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that we did, you know, this is with our own capital, we listened to what folks wanted in our communities, and, and so we were able to invest in, in, a, in developing a coffee shop there. Because again, it was what we could were able to handle with the amount of money that we did, but it was the kind of thing that we knew people were leaving the community in order to experience. To be able to go to a really pretty little cafe with Wi-Fi, you know, and other pretty people around, you know, and opportunities to get to know people. Those were the kind of things that we wanted to build, and we were able to do that um, as well. Next slide. And so we first had to partner with, because um, uh, we know we wanted to build a community space, but we didn't know how to do coffee. So we partnered with a really great coffee uh, maker and roaster called Birch Coffee. Um, and then later on, uh, next slide, we, what we were then able to do was actually acquire the full interest, and then we were able to share some of that interest with a local investor from the community. And next slide. And then we, this place has become, even though it's a tiny little 400 square foot spot, I mean, it's, it's got the kind of activity, you know, where people come and, you know, look for, um, they find people and create um, interactions for job creation um, before to find, like, boyfriends and girlfriends. I mean, it's a really hot little spot where people can do that. It's just a really good place to hang out. Next slide. And it really has become sort of like a centerpiece within the local community to help make that happen. Next slide. And it now, and now we've renamed it the Boogie Down Grind Cafe. Boogie Down is another name for uh, the South Bronx. And it is one of our few truly locally owned businesses in that community. But what it has done is really inspired people to recognize that this is a possibility for them in communities like the South Bronx, that, this, that we can own our own stuff. We can get to the point to help make that happen. So, and so the next thing, another thing that folks were talking about was about how do are there job creation opportunities here? You know, if there, if once we know that the world is changing, the economy is changing with it, are we preparing our people to do that? And for the most part, when we think about technology, which runs everything in this world at this point, it feels like um, there's still when you hear technology referred to in low status communities. All we hear about in many cases is that there's this digital divide. If only poor people had access to the internet, 
they'll, you know, they'll, it'll actually make lives easier for them. But actually, it's not true. Low status communities, believe me, they've, they've leapfrogged um, the, the whole idea of a, through smartphones. So even if they don't have um, internet within their houses um, or on a computer, we use smartphones, and that's like 80% across the board around the country. So the digital divide is not about just broadband access. Next slide. It's about are you simply a consumer of technology or are you producer of it? I.e., are you building the businesses? Are do you are you working in the field? Are you just you know lining up at a Mac store when a new product comes out? So what we are trying to do in low-status communities is make sure that people in low-status communities can fully participate in the technology economy. Next slide. But that's really, okay, now this is, this is really too bad, because this is really difficult, because what we do know is that tech, center, tech sector diversity absolutely does not match up with American diversity. We know that American diversity, probably by 2040, we're not going to be a majority white country. But um, the, the, the stats um, from whether it's major tech companies or little tech companies or, or the governments or municipal governments, we know that the number that we're actually losing people in technology because we know that there's like some serious hiring bias in technology. It's very serious. It's just not, you know, it's overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male. Um, it's not so great for white women, really not good for people of color. I mean, it's in the low single digit percentages for people of color in particular. So, but instead of trying to figure out, like, okay, how do we fight against um, tech bias, which is a huge thing to do, and lots of people have been trying to do it for years. Frankly, we came up with an opportunity, or what we, we accepted hiring bias as one of the things that we've got to deal with and built a business that actually that wasn't going to be affected by it, by building a, biz, a B2B business. Um, next slide. And so it's called Startup Box. Um, next slide. Startup Box and Startup Bronx is the first one, that the first iteration that we did. And we did that because what we wanted to do was create new opportunities for low status communities to have access into the tech economy and with, do it with career ladders and as a way to build their communities as well. Next slide. And so some of the, our talent pool, both whether they were high school dropouts or people that actually had some experience in the workforce or people that actually had um, computer science or other um, engineering or other kind of, of, of technology degrees, those were people we weren't expecting to see um, come across our roles when, when we opened up the doors to actually be hiring people, but that's what we found. But again, we knew that there was some significant um, bias within the hiring uh, in technology. Next slide. But what we also understood, because we did a good 18, maybe 24 months worth of um, market research to understand that there were a lot of developers who were not real happy with the kind of offshore options for a certain part of the software development pipeline. And it's called quality assurance, where you're literally, all you're doing is testing software. Kind of like, think about it, if you're a writer and you have an editor check your work, same things with software developers. They have folks that are testing their work. And um, we knew that, uh, at least in the entertainment market, where there's a lot of heavy user interface work, um, that stuff was being offshored and people, you know, to India, China, um, and uh, Eastern Europe, but many of them weren't happy with the quality of the services that they were getting. So what that meant was that we realized that if we could compete, we, because we were in the same time zone, we um, at, spoke literally the same language, and then and we could actually provide a value add in terms of cultural insights for them, then maybe we could do this. We could actually, we could bring people to our space. Um, next slide and actually have them do this work. So what we did was actually set up a, uh, we, we did a pilot where we paid, um, my company paid folks and then gave away the product to Nickelodeon and another game developer called Tresenza. And next slide. And at that point, you know, we were able to, to build up a model, show these companies, next slide, that we were able to create new, a model, a way for them to get this work done locally, you know, in the same time zone um, by people who actually like, literally spoke their language. Next slide. And do it in a way that actually made life better for, for them in an easier way. Next slide up. And next slide. And what we got 
were opportunities for number one, our clients to be super happy that we were, that we had a, a service. We offered a service. We didn't say we're going to put somebody on a desk in your your place. We're going to create this service and we're going to sell you this service. And then we also put money in the pockets of people that wanted to to build their um, resumes within the tech world because software services and quality assurance services, as it's actually called, are the kind of things which you could build a career on. It's actually really well um, regarded. Uh, skill within the uh, within the software industry. And so we got some happiness on both sides, which made life much easier for everybody. Next slide. And this slide is just to show us that those, that those numbers are in the billions to show that that software testing market is, is actually going forward. Next slide. Um, and then what we were, knew we were able to do is that create, we literally set up our own shop so that people could work in our, in our office. Next slide. And so we specifically, next slide, we were able to put this out on, the, on a street corner that was actually a pretty hot corner when we first, what, you know, 20 years or so ago, when the neighborhood was actually, you know, sort of had much, much higher crime rates than it does right now. Now we're, our crime rates are lower than pretty much anywhere else in New York City, which is awesome. But these young people were able to work um, in the spot. Next slide and stay on this one. We also made sure that we could do this, this, this spot um, on the main street in our community with, in a place that had big windows because we wanted people to look inside and see people, black and brown people, doing technology. And literally part of their work was literally when someone would come and be confused at the doors, like, what are you doing? And they would have, to, each one of the staff members in turn would have to get up and explain what quality assurance was that they were a company. And it has become like a really tremendous source of pride for the local community. Next slide. And we recruited people by doing gaming tournaments just to get them in the door because we knew that having this space would also provide us a great first screen to get people who were kind of cool um, you know, to work with because you, want to, the, the, you have to work really closely with people and you have to make sure that you know, people who are player, good players and they're like fair players and either good losers or bad, you know, it's a good thing. You want to have it. You can tell who's good to work with or not. So that was our very first screens in order to um, recruit talent. Next slide. And it also became a great place that really was sort of like the most, um, the coolest non-community center type community center, if there's such a thing. Um, you know, we're even, even during some of the, I think some of the hardest days in New York City after some pretty, uh, uh, egregious, you know, police brutality cases. We were actually able to use that space as a way to bring um, local, our local police precinct and the and the local community together by way of a gaming tournament. And um, you know, yeah, they were playing Call of Duty, so yes, they were shooting at each other, but it was virtual. And those are the kind, only kind of guns I like. Um, but. And it really, and we were actually one of the only, actually, we was, no, we were the only precinct in the South Bronx that didn't show a rise in negative community and police relations um, at that time. So I'm grateful for that. Um, next slide. Um, and so, but this is just a, a sort of graph of like the idea that we can take this idea of, of startup boxes and um, wherever there's um, a low status community, there's also nearby a thriving tech sector and creating these B to, these B to B uh, tech service companies um, actually creates jobs in those local communities, which also support the and expand the local tech ecosystems. And these are some of the places where we've got some interest in, in, in going forward. Next slide. Um, and also, since Startup Box has done its work in terms of having a visible presence on the avenue, and you know, we're using it also in the next uh, inc incubated group that's coming in is actually a health and wellness studio, also creating opportunities for people to see folks in our communities, not only own a business, because there's a young woman who actually owned this, this now it's a mobile, it was a mobile spa. Um, on December 1st, it will actually have its own brick and mortar space where the old Startup Box is. And um, just to see that we can do things like this in our communities as well. Um, we also acquired a really small little um, uh, former rail station uh, that was designed by, I'm sure it's a few architecture heads out there, Cass Gilbert, one of the great American architects. He, the same time he was designing the Woolworth building, he also um, built little rail stations up in the South Bronx and we acquired one of them. Um, and we did that because, you know, it was actually after rail service, next slide, after rail service was um, uh, sort of we lost the fight to, to the car. Um, you know, the, it became a little strip mall when the owner died. That's when we were able to um, acquire it because Amtrak didn't want anything to do with it. So next slide up. So we hired these young kids to actually do this, this mural uh, on it simply because we didn't want to be this shuttered, you know, ugly, graffitied up 
fallow looking thing that just made people think, oh, there's nothing going on there. So, but now, next slide. So but now we're thinking, we responded to the fact that whether it was our advisory board or the, all the polling that we did, people really want those third spaces that are neither work nor home that, all, that make people feel like they're, they're family friendly and they're places for us to be social because we don't have too many of those things. And, you know, and all the surveys that went across age and gender and, and, and race as well, which was super exciting to see that. So we're going to transform this spot. Um, into uh, what we're hoping to be sort of like a local food hub uh, with local chefs. Because again, if people re retaining the talent, you got it, next slide, we have to give people what they want. And this is actually it's based on a business model out in Brooklyn called Bergen, um, next slide that has these four little individual kitchens, each run by a new, by a restaurateur. And our idea is like, we also wanna make sure that we're keeping um, local culinary talent in the Bronx, re retaining that talent because we know we have it, we've got plenty of it. So next slide out. And so we just got some, um, the, some financing. We have a great partner that we're working with right now to actually bring more of dining diversity to the Bronx, which we're super excited about. Um, next slide. And, but the idea here, the idea of like building all of these kind of these models, if it's about retaining the talent, giving people reasons to think about their community in ways that they haven't before, um, that, that shows that there's value in it, that makes them want to stay, but ultimately it's all that lifestyle infrastructure, but you have to keep adding to it, or at least at least adding to it till it's there. And so we thought we had an amazing opportunity um, in this regard. So this is a former juvenile detention facility. My dad was actually a janitor there back in the 1960s and 70s. It's been closed uh, since 2011. And back then, I pitched to the Bloomberg administration that that little five acre site, and I know that's like nothing in, you know, in, in Nashville terms, in terms of acreage, but it's huge for New York, um, that that site really could be the, the site where we can build all sorts of opportunities for um, the social, environmental, and economic transformation using real estate to do it. So we, next slide. And so we thought about how do we do that? And some of the things that we wanted to see on that site were mixed income housing. You know, housing for people that would, that had the opportunity, because yes, you want to build for a range of affordabilities, because there are people who are doing quite well. And you want to keep them there, because we know that having their example and having them spend their money there is also really important. And of course, you build stuff for, for people who are in the lower income range as well. But of course, you have a mix of incomes there. You create jobs through this opportunity as well. You look for what the economic drivers are, and you figure out ways to attract them in so that that can be used as a way to employ people. So um, technology and different types of manufacturing, um, apparel in particular was a big one. Um, as well. And uh, public space, we all know, everybody in this room knows that public space is the great democratizer and how we build that with community gardens, um, you know, green markets, plazas that are really beautiful, makes people want to be, it, it's, you don't need much to participate in it. And of course, commercial and retail opportunities because we don't have many ways for money to stay in the community. Most of the businesses are actually not owned by people that live there. So a dollar circulates once through poor communities as it circulates like 14 to 17 times. 17 times in terms of wealthier ones. Um, next up. And so, next slide. And so we realize that that kind of, the idea that there's like a little um, spot in the middle between a residential area and also a um, the blue part is the, the, the industrial part, that there's a place where that little hinge area where, where literally it, it, nothing really happens. And we find that kind of um, topography in a lot of, of post-industrial American cities. Next slide. And, and especially in this particular area, like on, the, on this spot, where one side of the street was the jail and the other side was basically, it's like a, a par old parking lot that actually wasn't really used, um, an illegal chop shop, um, a little trucking business. And basically, but what people in the neighborhood knew that this spot was used for was the place where, um, uh, where prostitutes, excuse me, where truckers would come to pick up a prostitute because it was lonely and desolate. But imagine, next slide, you know, if the site looked more something like this, you know, having you know, a 24-hour city where there's, um, you know, where there's uh, farmer's markets, where there's businesses that are open you know, at different times of the day, um, where there's opportunities for people to be going into and out of their homes all of the time. Next slide. And so our goal was not here to just say, oh, we want one nice little spot, next, so next slide. We wanted to raise the bar for what passed for real estate development in low status communities. Next slide. 
And so we put together possibly one of the most diverse teams that New York City, next slide, has ever seen in terms of minority and women-owned uh, businesses and developers. Um, and then we put together a proposal, next slide, that had 1,200 units of mixed income housing, um, including 100 units of low-income home ownership, um, and also some really beautiful market rate housing up above. Next slide. Um, and, the, and there was also what uh, my favorite part was that you know inherent within all of this there were 800 permanent jobs based on the fact that we had 200,000 square feet devoted to light manufacturing, um, some technology, retail, and and other types of of space as well. Next slide. And so building this this model out was 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 five years in the making. And unfortunately, we did not win this bid. Um, instead, our city decided to do more business as usual and decide that they were going to build um, essentially a low-income housing project with a health center and a community center. And that's pretty much what is being built there. So, but that, all that to say, next slide, is that, you know, where we've got a lot of other things cooking, you know, in the, um, in, in the future, which is really exciting. Um, some definitely some other great properties in, that we're planning on doing that same kind of mixed income housing and mixed use commercial development model. But this is, this is the one to end on this quote, but which you can't see, but it's Dr. King, it was a quote from a um, letter from a Birmingham jail, and it goes something like, I serves that you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Next slide. Um, and, uh, and this just goes on for a little while. Because essentially, what we've come to understand about thinking of communities as corporations, and that the real key to doing it, when we're talking about low status communities, is retaining the talent that's already there, not expecting it to grow up and be somebody someplace else so that you take that they're a positive example. Um, of, proactive example of what you can do to like grow up and be somebody great in this world and also their wealth creation of opportunities as well instead of taking that out you bring it in but it has a shelf life and it and and, and what we're seeing i think around the country in terms of the 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 trauma and the drama that we're hearing about gentrification and displacement is that we're, we're automatically, many of us are automatically assuming that it is just way too late for things to move forward because, but since talent retention has a shelf life, we can either create new models and opportunities for people to do things that are different. Um, next slide. Um, what we can do now is like, you know, do we want to think about how, when we're, how do we want to do business as usual? and then continue to create you know, these models and tributes to our collective failures? Or do we want to build models and monuments to hope and possibility? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Majora. That was amazing. A lot of those spaces and places and faces look a lot like the ones that we have here in Nashville. And it's so exciting to see how you were able to transform through your citizen activities uh, those spaces and places and gives us inspiration that we might do the same thing here. I'm Cyril Stewart. I'm the Vice President of the Civic Design Center. And uh, welcome you. Glad you're here. The plan of Nashville that we talked about earlier was conceived by the Civic Design Center, uh, and it took two years to put it together. It was rolled out here in this venue uh, several years ago, and that was 13 years ago. And those 10 principles that were put forth are still valid today, are the same kind of things that Majora has used in her community and that we use in ours. The 10 principles are relevant, but there's one that I think is especially relevant today, and I'd like to share with that one with you as we close. Principle number four asks for the creation of convenient and efficient transportation infrastructure with an interconnected network of mass transit opportunities that serve our citizens 24-7. Well, that was from 2004, 13 years ago. Can you imagine what would have happened had we started implementing 13 years ago? Well, we heard from Mayor Barry this morning that now, now, now is the time. Now is the time 
We cannot wait any longer for our infrastructure. So today I'd like for you to all to present you with a, an opportunity to be a citizen in action. And that is, number one, if you're a business, please consider joining the Nashville Civic Design Center and the 75 other businesses and organizations that have already signed on to be part of the Transit for Nashville Coalition. And we're helping to get the word out, we're helping to educate voters, to gather signatures, and we're enlisting supporters to help implement this transit vision for our city. If you're a resident, then I ask you to look on your table right now, and there is on that table a petition that you can sign. So before you leave here today, if you will sign that petition, and if you don't get to it today, and when you go home, talk to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors, uh, to everyone that you can see, and ask them to sign on at transitfornashville.com. And finally, please attend the public events scheduled in your community and practice the ultimate act of citizenship in action by participating and voting in a referendum in 2018. Well, once again, thank you all so much for coming today. We thank you for being citizens in action, and we thank you for the support of the Nashville Civic Design Center. Have a wonderful afternoon. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.